record this. Um, and then whatever. Get Canvas up on here. Okay. Okay. So, um, I'll bring you guys over here. So I use Canvas a lot, like I said, and I like to be organized. So um, a couple of things. First, if you haven't done the student responsibility agreement, do it. Just get it out of the way for all your classes. So it's here. Um, I assume it'll disappear after everyone's done with it. I put the Zoom link for the class on the home page here. So um, if you, it's also in an announcement, but I figured that would be helpful. Um, so it's there, it's the same for the entire semester. Just click on that and you'll be let into the class. Um, and then what else do I want to point out? So I do, like I said, make all of the PowerPoints available to you. So you can print them out ahead of time if you want or you can follow them on a laptop, on a tablet, on your phone, whatever works for you. And they're all gonna be under modules. So modules is where a lot of the material is gonna be. Um, I put the note-taking strategies handout that I gave uh, out last time as well here. Um, and then here's the first lecture. Most of that's just like kind of intro syllabus stuff, but there's a couple of slides. <clears throat> I just need to get through, I think two more today and we'll be done with this lecture. Um, there's the PDF version. So the PDF version, like I said, has the lines next to it, next to each slide. So it's like a handout if that's helpful for you to print out. You guys on Zoom, that's what that looks like. Um, you can download it if you want to just by clicking on that. And then the other option is the PowerPoint version, obviously just the slides. So if you want the whole slides or you want to set up a different way to print it out, that's fine. That's there. I will say if you're just viewing the PowerPoints in Canvas and you don't download the file, sometimes stuff gets cut off. And I've had that happen in a number of different classes. I don't know if it's a browser setting or if it just happens no matter what, um, the PowerPoint to, to Canvas conversion. But I would recommend if you're using the PowerPoint the PPTX file, download it rather than just looking at it on Canvas. Most of the time it'll be fine, but some stuff might be cut off. So those will always be there at least 12 hours ahead of time. I think I got today's up at like nine last night. I was a little bit behind, um, but yeah, they'll be up by midnight the night before. Um, so you can access them, print them out if you want to. Um, and I might make a few changes here and there. So. I try to put the final, final version up here, but there might be a few like tiny wording changes here and there, but for the most part, yeah, that's what, that's what I'll be going over. So those will all be here. I'm gonna break them down by units. The units are simply what's on an exam. So unit one, all of this will be on exam one. Um, and then I'll break down the second unit um, into another module. So you'll see a table here. So for those of you guys on Zoom, um, I don't know if we'll get to this today. We might, um, but this, you're gonna need to download this. I have a hard copy here for people in class, but you're gonna finish this over the weekend if we get to it. Um, so I'll put other assignments and stuff here um, as well. So I try to put everything together. Up here, I put the links for the Zoom link again, try to put it everywhere. <laughs> And then um, I'm recording all these lecture videos. So I set up a playlist on YouTube. So you should be able to click on this and see all of the videos that I've uploaded. Um, this should be the 1101 playlist. I also teach 2100, um, which is AMP. So just make sure you're obviously watching the right videos, but this should take you to the right playlist. Um, so one link for all of those videos as I, you know, obviously lecture and upload them throughout the semester. Um, any assignments that you need to turn in are going to be obviously under assignments. So this themes table that if we get to today, I'll have you guys do over the weekend, you will upload it here um, under the miscellaneous assignments. So the major themes and biology table, um, if you have, if you fill out the hard copy, you guys in class, you can just take a picture of it and upload it, but it'll be easier for me to have everything 
on Canvas uploaded versus some people turning in hard copies, other people, because I won't see you guys on Monday anyway to turn in the hard copy. So that'll be due, assuming we get there again on Monday. So that's where you'll upload stuff. Um, and then, yeah, I already pointed out the exams. That's just for the dates, so they're on your calendar. Any questions about that? Anyone? Okay. I want to make sure everyone's kind of knows where to go for stuff. All right, we're done with that. This is where we ended, and I went through it kind of quickly. Um, so I wanted to bring it up again. Okay, so these are, I mean, we're talking about life, right? Biology is the study of life. So these are, you can probably add a few more here and there, but these are gonna be typically the seven characteristics that you'll see. Some of them are kind of separated out every now and then. You might see a different number, but the same concepts will be brought up each time. These are the seven characteristics that define life. If something does not have one of these characteristics, it is not necessarily, it's not considered alive. There's this few like weird um, uh, borderline, are they alive, are they not, like a virus. We don't, most people don't consider them alive, but they have DNA and they can reproduce, uh, but they're not, they don't have cellular organization. So there's a few like weird kind of in-betweens, but these are gonna be, for your purposes, the seven characteristics that define life. So everything you can break down to cells. So even if it's a bacterium, it's just one cell, it's made of a cell. Um, so that's the most basic unit of life. Ordered complexity. Um, so I'll talk about this on the next slide, but we're basically just a bunch of uh, atoms put together in a really complex way to make us function. So we're, you can break us down into atoms, but we're built up into an entire organism in a very ordered way, but it's also very complex. We respond to stimuli. So all living things respond to stimuli, including plants. They will, like sunflowers, will track the sun. That's a stimulus. Um, we talked about growth, development, and reproduction. So everything that's alive has to grow in some way. Maybe not a lot, but it'll grow um, and develop and change over its lifetime. Um, and then reproduce, so make more of it. Living things use energy. You guys talked about that. You um, mentioned that you know we have to eat. Um, so we use energy in one way or another. We maintain what's called homeostasis. Um, have you guys heard the term homeostasis before? Yeah, see some heads nodding. Hopefully on Zoom you guys have too. Um, so homeostasis just means we try to keep a state we, I, I'm gonna refer back to us a lot because that's the best reference probably, but living things maintain a stable internal environment. Our body temperature doesn't just fluctuate all over the place all the time. We're pretty much always around 98.6 degrees. That's one example of many different types of homeostasis within just our bodies. And then um, over generations, there's evolutionary adaptation. So organisms get more well adapted to their environment. That's the idea behind evolutionary adaptation. Um, and we'll talk more about that as we get into the themes of biology. Okay, so those are the seven characteristics of life. Um, I want you to be able to name them and briefly describe them. So this sort of goes back to um, that uh, structural complexity idea, we have this biological hierarchy of organization, and I'll come back to this again, but I've already referenced it in the fact that you can break any individual down, any living individual down into their component atoms. So you can break us down into oxygen atoms. All of these atoms come together to form higher and higher and more complex systems as we kind of move up the range. So atoms are the most basic, the smallest piece of this biolog biological hierarchy. So atoms are sort of the base. Everything's made of atoms. 
So it all goes back to chemistry. That's why we're going to talk a good bit about chemistry for the next few weeks, probably. Um, so atoms form molecules. So when atoms come together, that makes a molecule, so multiple atoms. So we're getting a little more complex there. Molecules come together and you get a cell. So that's, remember, the basic unit of life. So now we're at a living, we're at the living level, the cell. A bunch of cells will work together to make a tissue. So tissues um, are throughout our body, different cells, groups of cells working together make a tissue. Tissues working together create organs. So your heart is an organ. It has um, multiple tissues working together to make it pump blood throughout your body. So we're slowly moving up to greater and greater complexity here. So tissue to organ, um, organs form body systems or organ systems. So a bunch of organs working together. So um, your heart, all the blood vessels in your body, that's the cardiovascular system. So there's multiple organs working together there, your lungs, et cetera. So then you have multiple organ systems working together. So respiratory would be lungs, um, your heart, cardiovascular, um, urinary system, endocrine system, all of those work together to make the organism. So you have the, the body system or the organ system working together. And then above that, you get one organism. We will focus in this class, I'll continue on up the, up the scale here. In this class, we're mostly going to focus on just up to the cellular level. So we're going to start really small and kind of build up to cells and see how cells work together. Bio 2, if you go on, will be talking not really about tissues and organs, but it'll be the organismal level, level and up. So after you get to an organism, so we've built an organism, multiple organisms of the same species working together is a population. So population, a bunch of the same, a bunch of individuals of the same species. So a bunch of humans or a bunch of elephants, I guess those are elephants together, um, are a population. One more level up from there, a little bit more complex, you get a community. So a community is um, a bunch of different species interacting. So you can think of, yeah, the African savanna, I suppose, is what this is showing. Um, so you have elephants, you have some kind of hoofed animal, I don't know, trees, all different kinds of species um, interacting with each other, being eaten by each other. Um, there's mutualisms going on. There's all kinds of different interactions. That's a community. And then one more level up from there, you get the ecosystem. The ecosystem is going to include all of the abiotic or non-living things. So the water, the air, um, the chemicals surrounding that. That's going to be an ecosystem along with all of the living things. And then finally, at the highest level, you have the biosphere, which is the entire Earth. So as we study biology, we tend to focus as you kind of get more specialized, you focus on one area of this, but it's important to remember that we can start with atoms and make our way all the way up to the biosphere and all of this is included in biology, different classes of biology, um, but that's how we typically go about teaching biology and learning it from sort of the small level up to the larger big picture level. Any questions about that hierarchy? I know I didn't put the definitions up there. I don't remember if I have them on the next slide or in the next PowerPoint file or not. Um, but you wanna know what each of those are. So if I said, okay, there's a, a bunch of different species working together in an area, what would that be considered? You would say the community. If there's only one species, that would be a population. Um, if you have multiple tissues working together, you wanna know that's an organ. So you want to have this organization straight in your head and kind of know what each level, the definition of each level. So no questions? Okay. That's the end of that first PowerPoint. So I am going to pull up the next one here.
So like I said, we're doing some really big picture stuff here. Um, we're going to get into very small details pretty soon. Um, but this is still pretty big picture information. So we're going to talk about the nature of science, what science is, since maybe for a lot of you, this is for your first at least college level science course. And then some of these major themes that you'll see throughout the semester in biology. So first, what is science? How do we define science? It's a really broad category, broader than obviously biology. It encompasses a lot of different topic areas. But the goal really is to just increase the understanding of the world and systems in the world using observation and reasoning. So that using observation and reasoning is really important. We don't just make up answers, right? We have to observe something happening and then use our rational mind and experimentation to try to figure out why that's happening and how it works. So that's the ultimate big picture goal of science, just to understand what is going on around us. And how we do this is through the scientific method. How many people learn the scientific method in high school? Um, yeah, okay. So a lot of people have heard of the scientific method and it's simply the pattern or the way scientists go about answering questions. So it's a very specific list of steps, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, to figure out an answer to one of our, our questions about the world. freezing in here. Um, a really important aspect uh, about science and the scientific method is that it uses objective observations. So you guys have probably heard the terms objective and subjective. Um, and they're used pretty similarly throughout different areas of study. Um, but for our purposes, objective interpretations are using real evidence that you can point to to um, make that interpretation. So ideally, you don't bring any of your own personal bias into um, an experiment or an interpretation of an experiment. You use evidence. It's very kind of dry in a lot of ways. It's boring and dry, but that's the best way rather than subjective is the opposite. So that would be involving emotion and feelings and I feel like it should be this way or that way. Um, that's not how science is done. Science is, okay, this is what I saw from the experiment. So this is my interpretation. So as objective as possible without bringing in any other biases, it's nearly impossible to not have some kind of bias. I mean, we all have bias about how we understand the world around us, um, but scientists try to be extremely aware of those biases and not have them influence their interpretations. So objective interpretations are critical in science. I'm going to talk here about a couple of different types of reasoning. So we use reasoning to figure out answers to questions about the world. Um, there's a couple of different categories and knowing the categories isn't that important. Well, you guys need to know the categories, but the reason I'm telling you about the categories is so you understand how we can arrive at an answer. There's a couple different ways. So there's deductive reasoning and then inductive reasoning. So deductive is going to take really general principles that we understand and apply it to predict what's going to happen in a really specific scenario. So we understand that um, gravity applies on Earth, right? That's the general principle. We understand the, the law of gravity. If we drop a piece of paper, we can use that idea to predict what's going to happen to this paper, right? It's going to fall based on the law of gravity. And it does. So that's deductive reasoning and one of the simplest, obviously, examples. But you take a big picture idea, something that's generally accepted, 
and use that to predict something very specific that you're interested in. So kind of big picture to small picture. That's how I think of deductive reasoning, big to small or general to specific. Inductive reasoning is the opposite, which probably sounds kind of weird. How do you do, how do you do that? <laughs> um, so this is where you use a bunch of specific observations. So ideally a bunch. And from there, you construct a general scientific principle. So at some point we didn't know about the details of gravity way, 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 way back when. Um, that had, that general principle had to be developed. So inductive reasoning is going to develop those general principles just by looking at a lot of different instances of paper falling on the floor or a ball falling or you falling over or whatever falling to the ground. So that's inductive reasoning that's going to move from the specific, a very specific observation out to the more general principle. So the kind of opposite inverted pyramids, if you want to envision them like that. I have a couple of examples that I want you guys to think about and figure out if these are um, an example of inductive or deductive reasoning. So the first one is, you notice that every dog you see has hair. So you conclude that all dogs all over the world have hair or fur or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> so what type of reasoning would you think that is? Inductive or deductive? Inductive? Yeah. Sorry, I can't hear you guys very well. Yep, that is inductive. You have an observation, hopefully a bunch. You've seen more than one dog. They all have hair. So you think, even the dogs I haven't seen, they probably have hair. Right? So that's inductive reasoning. There's issues with that. Not every dog has hair, right? There's some hairless dogs. Um, so this reasoning works for the most part, but it's really important to keep in mind there's exceptions to almost every rule. But yeah, to get back to the general types of reasoning, that would be inductive reasoning. So then the second one, um, another example, if all mammals by definition have hair, so we define a mammal by having hair, and you find a mammal that doesn't have hair, you might conclude the animal is not a mammal. So what type of reasoning would that be? Deductive. Deductive, right? Yeah, good. So you're starting with a general principle. I have been told that all mammals have hair. So I see this mammal, maybe a hairless dog <laughs> or maybe a reptile that doesn't have hair. Um, so you conclude that it's not a mammal. In the case of the reptile, that's correct, right? Reptiles are not mammals. Um, so for the most part, you'd be right. It would be those weird exceptions where it doesn't necessarily work. And that's why I'll talk about on the next slide, we do a lot of different experiments, even asking the same question over and over just to get more results to make sure we're correct about this reasoning. So good, inductive versus deductive reasoning, both are very useful. Um, these days we use deductive a lot more because we have a lot of general principles. And then we try to use those to to predict specific outcomes, but they both have their place. Okay, so um, science is hypothesis driven by and large. Um, there's some, you know, non necessarily hypothesis driven kind of research projects out there, but for the most part, for your purposes, um, we do science by testing hypotheses. And that is where the scientific method comes in, which I've listed the steps for here. It's a really strict design. We do these steps in the same order every single time to try to figure something out in the world. So first you have to start with observation. If you don't have an observation, you can't really develop a question. So like with that dog example, um, you have to have observed a dog at some point, right? So observation is the very first part of the scientific method. You guys are observing things all of the time. You're probably wondering how things work all of the time without even realizing it. 
Um, so you're sort of doing at least the first part of the scientific method on a pretty regular basis. So you're, you make an observation and then you uh, develop a question. So the question could be anything. Um, yeah, there's many, many different questions. People have been studying many of the same systems for a long, long time and still have questions to come up with. So make an observation, develop a question from that observation, and then you develop hypotheses or one hypothesis. So hypotheses is just the plural. So can anyone give me a definition of a hypothesis? Like what have you heard a hypothesis defined as? I heard like if this happens, then this happens. Like if, if then, yeah, that's actually good, yeah. So it can be an if then statement. So that would be, yeah, a hypothesis. If mammals have hair, then this dog will have hair or something like that, yep. Any other definition of a hypothesis? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So an educated guess is maybe what you've heard a lot. Guess is sort of a, I don't know, it seems like you're just pulling it out of thin air, but yeah, an educated explanation. So basically what you do before you develop your hypothesis, you have a question, you do a whole lot of research. You go to the library, well, not really the library anymore. <laughs> you go to, you go online and look at a bunch of journal articles and other information on the question that you've developed and the system you've developed. And then you come up with a hypothesis based on all of that information. And it's based, yeah, it's an, it's an educated explanation or an educated answer to your question. And then you get to do the fun part where you do the experiments. The experiments are testing the hypothesis very specifically and in a very specific way. We're not really going to get into it a whole lot in here. There's a lot that goes into how to design an experiment to make sure you get an accurate answer. After that, you decide whether you support or reject the hypothesis. Um, you never prove a hypothesis, so make sure you know that. I will ask about that. Um, you can't prove a hypothesis, and that sounds kind of crazy but you can support a hypothesis and you can also reject it. So if you do an experiment and it shows that your hypothesis was incorrect, you can reject it. Your hypothesis was not right. If you do an experiment and it seems to say that your hypothesis was correct, then you support it. You don't prove it because there's always a possibility that somewhere out there in the universe, there's some scenario that will show your hypothesis to be false. Yes? So laws, like, like scientific laws? Yeah, that's actually a good question. And I'm going to get into theories and laws in just a minute. So um, laws, yeah. It's, it's a little bit complicated, but we will get to that, and that's a really good question. Laws are you can prove in a lot of different sciences you can prove laws yeah hypotheses you don't really prove yeah i'm glad you brought that up okay so yeah somewhere out there there might be a scenario where your hypothesis doesn't hold true that's why we support it as scientists we're extremely conservative about saying that we know the right answer we constantly question whether we're right or not. And that's why we support a hypothesis. The saying we've proven it is kind of jumping ahead and we can't really accurately say that. So support or reject are the two options. And then you come up with conclusions kind of explaining what your results mean in the big picture. So that's kind of the step-by-step -step example of the scientific method. Um, Typically, I put this diagram up here so for you guys on Zoom on the right. You come up with multiple hypotheses a lot of times, um, even for just one question. And then you'll run different experiments kind of negating some of those hypotheses. If um, So say you do experiment one, and that experiment, you reject hypotheses two and four. So you can throw them out. They're not the answer to your question. Then you kind of move on with hypothesis one and three. So in the next round, you have these two hypotheses, do an experiment, and then that experiment shows you that you can reject the first hypothesis. So, okay, hypothesis one is out. Hypothesis three is 
your best hypothesis, do some more experimentation, um, and then kind of support, reject that hypothesis. So it's an iterative process, which, which just means you kind of refine it over time. So you experiment, figure out what went wrong, refine it, do another experiment, and continue on. So it kind of keeps on going. It's very repetitive. All right, so that's kind of the basics, the really sort of most straightforward explanation of how science is done. And like I said, we're not going to go into a lot of experimental design, obviously. If you continue on in science, you'll take maybe some research methods courses and how to actually design an, ex an effective experiment. It's more complicated than you would expect. I'm going to give you a really simple example here. But there's so many factors that you can't control. That's kind of what makes experimentation difficult. Okay, so there's two, there's a few different terms that I want you guys to know. So first, there's the variable. So that's a factor that you alter in an experiment. So we're going to talk about amount of water and if it makes seeds grow. So I think I have this down here. I'll just pull it all up. <clears throat> so the water would be the variable. We're changing how much water something gets to see what happens. So the variable is what you change. And then there's two groups. So you have a control group and an experimental group. You always have to have both of them. Um, the experimental group is pretty straightforward. Um, you, that's where you alter the variable of interest. So alter how much water a plant is getting. The control group you have to have, so you have a baseline. So this is where the variable, the amount of water, for instance, is not changed. So maybe that, that varies on what your experiment is, but in this case, it's gonna be, okay, the control gets no water. And you always have to compare those two groups to each other. So you compare the results of the experimental group to the results of the control group, and then you see what that effect was and if your hypothesis was correct. So our example here is water necessary for a bean plant to sprout. Most of you guys probably know that the answer is yes. Um, plants need water, right? So our variable, like I said, is gonna be really water or no water, amount of water. Does it get water or does it not get water? <laughs> The experimental treatment is where water is added. Control treatment is where no water is added. You could do multiple experimental treatments where you have um, half a cup of water added, one cup of water added, one and a half cups. So you can make this more complicated, which you probably would for this type of scenario. And then you see nine out of 10 seeds sprouted in the watered pot and then none sprouted in the uh, non-watered pot in the control group. So that's what you compare. You compare nine to zero and you can say, yes, water is necessary. Give you guys a second to get that down. Okay, so that's about the, the extent of the experimental design that I'm going to talk about, but those are kind of the main, the main components of setting up an experiment. You need a variable, you need a control group, and you need an experimental group. And here we get into scientific theories and laws. So I'm really glad you asked this question. So you hear theories and you hear laws. Um, I want to give definitions for each one and um, yeah, I think in, so in different fields, these are kind of used differently. So within science, I would say these two terms are used the same way. When you get into like math where you have proofs and laws, those are kind of different from what we're talking about. Um, so for our purposes, we'll just focus on the science aspect. A theory is a proposed explanation for a natural phenomenon based on a general principle. Okay, what the heck does that mean? <laughs> Essentially, a theory, it's really hard for 
a hypothesis will be if it's supported a lot, it will get raised up to the level of theory. So theory is almost in our scientific world sort of the highest level of acceptance. And it sounds weird, right? So people will always say, um, well, it's just the theory of evolution. It's only a theory. So in, in common, common, not, uh, common language, theory is like, well, I just kind of came up with it out of the blue. But a theory, a scientific theory has a ton of support. Many, many, many experiments have been done um, to support and develop that theory. So a hypothesis can move to a theory, but that hypothesis can't just be tested once. It has to be tested hundreds, thousands of times in order for that idea to move up to theory level. So how we talk about these terms in like everyday life is a little bit different from how they're defined from a scientific perspective, which makes for a little bit of confusion. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So some scientific theories you know of, um, I'm not gonna ask this because I wanna get to a video about this, um, but the, uh, the theory of evolution by natural selection is a really common one. Are there any others that come to mind? I guess I will ask. Nothing, anyone on Zoom, any other theories? Okay, we'll go into at least one other one, the cell theory um, in, a, in a little while. Okay, so then yeah, we get into theory versus law. Um, and this video, I think I have time for it. So we're gonna watch it. This is a, um, a YouTube channel that I'll probably show a good bit called the Amoeba Sisters. They have really great explanations of some of the stuff, a lot of the stuff I talk about. Um, and I think it's helpful well, I didn't really describe the difference between a theory and a law, but I'm going to let them describe it to you. Um, oh, yeah, theory of evolution. Thank you, Amy Jo. <laughs> I see your chat. Um, so, yeah, you'll be seeing these, these uh, animations again. So for you guys on Zoom, I'm going to stop sharing, and I'm hoping the volume works in here. And hopefully. And I'm just going to turn you guys to the... Screen. This is kind of the best way I figured out how to do it, considering. This is a checkers game where grandson and granddad will borrow it. Some words used casually have different meanings than when used scientifically. I'm going to give you an example. When I was younger, I noticed that sometimes after it rained, I'd find earthworms in puddles. And I'd wonder, why are these earthworms coming out of the soil when they're safe there and risking their very lives in these puddles? I mean, I was pretty sure they don't like being in the puddles. They were getting stuck in them for some reason. Keep in mind that this was before the age of Googling information, and I came up with all kinds of ideas. Maybe the earthworms actually were crazy about water, but they didn't know how bad it was out there until they found themselves stuck in a puddle. Maybe when it rained, the water flooded their underground tunnels, but it somehow confused or disoriented them, so instead of digging down, they dug up, launching themselves into a puddle. Either way, it was my job to rescue them, because, hey, earthworms are pretty cool. Something I can add to my resume. My ideas about why earthworms ventured out when it rained were not really correct. If anything, maybe one of these ideas could have been used to develop a hypothesis. A hypothesis can be defined as a suggested explanation that I could then test. But see, back when I was a young kid, I would have told you that these were my own personal theories. And that's the problem with this word theory. The word theory tends to be casually used in this way in everyday life all the time. I'm sure you've heard your friends say before, I have a theory about that. When using the word theory in everyday life, theory might be an opinion, hunch, or guess. You might say you have a theory about why there's a water stain on the ceiling or why sushi is amazing, but it's important to understand that you are using the word theory very casually. See, a scientific theory is a very different thing. A scientific theory is an explanation supported by scientific evidence. It's fortified by facts. It's been tested repeatedly. And if you want a more detailed definition of a scientific theory, we have a link in our video details to recommend. The thing is, a scientific theory cannot be dismissed as just a theory. 
in order to reach the level of scientific theory, a scientific theory must be backed by science facts and evidence supporting it with repeated testing. There are many theories in science. There's a theory of the atom, atomic theory. There's the theory of general relativity. There's the cell theory that we frequently talk about in many of our videos. Now, while scientific theories can be disproven or modified, it is important to understand that the word theory in science has such a different meaning than the casual use of the word theory in everyday life. When I was younger, I used to think that theories one day could graduate into laws. I think my misconception had something to do with learning how a bill becomes a law, and somehow I thought scientific theories followed a similar path. I'm really not sure where I got this misconception. But in case you have it too, scientific theories do not graduate into scientific laws. They can't, because they're completely different things. One is not more powerful than the other either. The word law might sound more fancy, but it's not. They truly are just different things, but they are both very important in science. Scientific laws tend to describe a natural phenomena, whereas a scientific theory can provide a scientific explanation for it. Many scientific laws are even represented mathematically. For example, Newton's second law of motion shows how acceleration is related to the force and mass of an object. It can be written mathematically here, but as a law, it tends to describe, not explain why. Since we tend to specialize more with biology, let's not forget about Mendel's laws. He's often called the father of genetics. He has three laws that you can explore, law of segregation of genes, law of independent assortment, and the law of dominance. These laws describe phenomena happening with his pea plant experiments. And while these laws each describe a natural phenomena, they don't give an explanation of why the phenomena happens. As a side note, that actually would have been really hard to do if DNA wasn't yet understood in his time. Understanding how the casual use of the word theory differs from the scientific use of the word theory, as well as understanding how theories and laws are different things, are all very important in science. Sometimes I wish science had a different word from theory, just because the casual everyday use of that word is so different from the scientific use of that word. And before we go, in case you also have been curious this whole time about why earthworms may come out when it rains and find themselves in puddles, check out some further reading suggestions that mention different researcher hypotheses in the video description. It's pretty fascinating. Well, that's it for the Media Sisters, and I remind you to stay curious. All right, so ho hopefully that sort of helped explain that. So it's a what versus why situation. It seems weird because I remember, I think, learning in high school that, yes, theories become laws. Um, but they, but yeah, they they don't. It just, it's a why. So theories describe why, explain why, and laws describe what. So why versus what. That's a really important distinction. Um, and I think we'll stop there for today. Um, so yeah, that assignment, we didn't get to it. Um, I'll change the due date to like Wednesday of next week. So we'll get to those themes on Monday. So I'll see you guys on Zoom in here on Monday, and then you guys I'll see you on Zoom. So have a good weekend. <laughs>